this out on the back too. I have the editor that said I was uh, Dickensian, and now I have. That's your James Joyce. Joyce. <laughs> yeah, those two. That's going right on the back. <laughs> there we go. A uh, solution. One of my solutions to that is block. Have as many works in progress yeah. as possible. You block on one, you move over to the other. Yeah. Greetings, Skullgateers. I'm Chris Van Dyke, president of Skullgate Media and editor-in-chief of our flagship anthology series, Tales from the Year Between. Welcome to Coffee at the Skullgate, an interview series where I sit down and talk to one of the writers and creatives whose work has appeared in our books. Today, I'm talking to A.A. Rubin, who is one of the creatives behind our recent release, Under New Suns. I'm excited to talk to Ari today because while I don't know him well, for our work, from our work together, I get a sense that we have a lot in common, um, and I'm looking forward to learning a little more about him. Um, so Ari, um, welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by. Um, I guess I just want to start about um, who, I guess, who are you outside of writing? Just sort of give me the little elevator pitch of who is A.A. Rubin. So um, my name is A.A. Rubin. It's actually a pen name. It's my real, it's not really a pen name. It's my real initials and my mm -hmm. real last name. Sure. But uh, <laughs> my real name is Ari. Uh, that's the first A in A.A. Rubin. I am actually on childcare leave for my job as a teacher now so okay. when i am right. not writing i'm a full-time dad take so. care of my uh, two kids maggie who's seven who's also in under new sons her first uh yes. commissioned <laughs> artwork and gary who's three most of my day is with him when okay, cool. she's at school and otherwise um when i go back i will be a high school english teacher i also hey, do freelance hey, writing go. and editing Okay, so yeah, I knew you were a teacher. I guess I, I don't know if I knew and forgotten, but okay, yeah, high school English, that's my jam too. What do you teach normally, I, like what grades levels? I normally teach the entire senior class at, okay. the, um, at the Columbia Secondary School. I have AP Lit. For the cool. non-APs, okay. I teach an existentialism course. Um, being the uh, Columbia Secondary School, we have a philosophy curriculum in addition to our English program. Um, and I also coach basketball and right. uh, martial arts as well. All right, since so we're I'm here, we talk about writing and books. Or what's like your favorite book to teach in AP Lit? Interesting. Uh, my favorite book to teach in AP Lit is probably it's going to be a boring answer. It's probably Hamlet. Okay, hey, there's no, nothing the reason, boring. The about reason Hamlet. why I like books like Hamlet, I love I love Shakespeare. I love Dickens. I love teaching Wuthering Heights actually. Also, okay. is because. Unlike most English teachers, and I don't mean to offend you if this is you, <laughs> okay, but that's I fine. do not like to teach books like The Great Gatsby. Um, okay. I would much rather teach Hamlet than The Great Gatsby because one, I feel like once you've taught Gatsby, you've taught it. I could have lessons in Gatsby. You could have lessons in Gatsby. Right. We're on the same page. We're going to be teaching the same thing, the symbolism of the green light. We, we know her. There's also sort of an like, answer to it. There's, yeah, there's a right yeah. answer or a wrong answer. I could teach right. Hamlet every year that I'm teaching and it will be different every time. I could give the book to every English teacher I've ever met. Everybody and we'd approach teaches, it differently. And yeah. they would approach it differently. Your lesson about act three, scene one or choose any one that you're gonna do is gonna be vastly different than mine. And I find that more interesting, especially as I get on in my career and I'm teaching books more years in a row mm -hmm. that the more open-ended books, the thicker, happier right, ones. Yeah. So if I teach something like Hamlet, I teach something like Wuthering Heights, um, you know, those are the kinds of books that are open to uh, multiple interpretations. Uh, those are the ones I end up enjoy teaching the most. Cool. Um, all right, so before we get to Under New Suns in a bit, which is the Skullgate Media side of things, um, what what's some of the work that you've done that you're you're proud of or that you like, might want to share? Um, um, some stuff I you've write, done in the past. I write in a whole variety of genres. Right. Um, I write in uh, comics, as we're going to talk about in a little bit. Oh. I also have a Writer's Digest Award in formal rhyming poetry. So, and pretty much everything in between. I write literary fiction, I write science fiction, I write fantasy, um, all sorts of different things. Um, I try not to limit myself in what I write. I had a story come out recently in a Another anthology, Tales from the Dream Zone, which is a um, a ghost story, actually. Okay, cool. Um, classic 
a ghost story. The editor of that book called it Dickensian, um, and which uh, was interesting because when I was writing the one for Under New Suns, I was very aware of my influences. Mm -hmm. I was not aware of that influence until the editor said that it was. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, it probably is. Um, I did, um, I had a number, a, I have a poem coming out in July in a uh, journal called Love Letters to Poe, which is obviously a gothic horror journal. Right, cool. And, and I really like that. So that, that's nice. something that's upcoming. And then I have my work with uh, Comic Book School, where I did a uh, superhero spoof called Mr. Stupendous that I'm actually working on the second installment of for our next anthology. And I also did an illustrative flash fiction piece, which was a mashup fantasy spaghetti western. Okay, okay cool. twist ending <laughs> that I, that's one of the cooler things I've written recently. All right, so you definitely do sort of write a little bit of everything. We got poetry, we got flash spaghetti westerns, we got science fiction, we got a little bit of ghost stories in there, which pretty much just subsumes the next question I often ask is what style do you tend to write in? And it sounds like the answer is yes, all of the above. Yes. Um, and and I, I was uh, thinking about this the other day. I had to I had to answer this for, for another interview. And <laughs> I was thinking, you know, Walt Whitman wrote that famous line, if I contradict myself, you know, mm -hmm. what I contradict myself, I contain multitudes. And I was thinking like these days, everyone's trying to pigeon them, pigeonhole themselves into a specific genre yeah. to work on their brand. You know, you know, a lot of people might not know that uh, Walt Whitman wrote a temperance novel before he became a serious poet. Imagine if someone told him, stick with your brand. And yeah. that was <laughs> all we ever got of Walt yeah. Whitman, you know? A.A. Um, a. A. Milne, who's most famous for, um, for the Winnie the Pooh books, mm -hmm. yeah. wrote all sorts. He wrote detective novels. He wrote social commentary. But he's known for Winnie the Pooh now. You know, it's a relatively new thing, this, where you're going to uh, pigeonhole yourself into a genre and call it your brand. And I understand that. And, and I understand yeah. the benefits of it marketing-wise. But creatively, I don't like to limit myself like that. It's yeah. not like, I don't think that the poetry audience is not going to read me because I write comics or... Right, yeah. Not, you know. Well, especially yeah, the, so many of the authors in the early 20th century, they were writing poetry, they were writing plays, they were writing novels, novellas. Um, yeah, and especially, like, I know, I, I particularly grade it when people are always trying to pitch it, like, is this YA or not? And I'm like, that's such a new concept. You like, know, books, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, I recently got the new edition of the Ursi books by Ursula Le Guin. And it's been um, marketed which are YA. One of my favorites. It's, it's under that YA imprint yeah. now. I couldn't find it in the bookstore. Um, she has, in the latest series of paperback, she has a little essay at the end of it where she talks about writing each one, which as a writer, yeah. I find interesting. Yeah. Um, they're pretty good and they're, they're pretty insightful. And it's now in YA. It's like it wasn't <laughs> in YA when I was a kid. Well, it's not the same like Ender's Game. Like Sam, like it's often pitched so it was a YA game book. And it's like, sure, teenagers can read it, but it wasn't written with like a 12-year-old audience in mind. He yeah. wrote a book. Same, um, yeah, same thing. That was in the science fiction section yeah. when I... Uh, when I was writing, and you know what, when Mary Shelley was writing Frankenstein, there was no science fiction section. Right. It was just. It was just right. What did, did she invent? Was she writing science fiction? Was she writing horror? Was she writing speculative fiction? Yes, all of the above, and yeah. she was just writing a story. Uh, good. Yeah. I like. And and, uh, and it is what it is. It's like what uh like Kurt Vonnegut on the is in the literary fiction section. You know, yeah. there's plenty of spaceships and aliens and uh, all that kind of stuff in there. A lot of it is yeah. arbitrary. I forget what the book. I think I was looking for The Handmaid's Tale. And so I went into Barnes and Noble and I couldn't find it because I was looking like it was like where it was shelved. It's like, is this literature? Is this science fiction? It's like, it's a book. Give me, show me where the books are. Um, all right. So let's talk a little about Under New Sun. So like, I, I like to think at least that our anthology is a little unique um, because first all the writers build a shared world together before they tell a story set in that world. Um, so I just wanted, can you tell me a little about how you approached creating a world with another group of people and then maybe what led into your choosing what's, what little slice of that you wanted to talk about with your story? Uh, so actually, this was a very interesting experience being working in the uh, shared world anthology. And I've worked in shared universes before, but never quite like this. The, the idea with Good. the That's my goal. turns and all that kind <laughs> yeah. of thing. That was brand new to me. And I, I actually, it made me uncomfortable at first. Um, but I did, I did end up liking it. And um, it was kind of like, you know, the way I ended up approaching it, I know we're going to talk comic books later, but it's like you're writing a Batman story. And right. you've got to kind of keep all of that in mind or Spider-Man, whatever one of these big 
superheroes you're writing. You're writing something that takes place in the Marvel universe or the DC universe, and you got to do your own little episode. Um, or right, right, okay. Like yeah. Actually, for this one, because it was science fiction, space opera type of thing, I was kind of thinking of each of my turns kind of like a an elevator pitch for a Star Trek episode. Right, yeah. Uh, kind of, you know. So... You go, what was the, you know, you create a character, see what kind of interesting character. And I actually ended up writing about the character that I created, um, which, which I know wasn't necessarily the intention and it wasn't my intention going in, but that's just how it, uh, how it turned out. And it was like, okay, so we have this situation where the guy is sent, um, you know, where they, they steal the ship and it jumps through this wormhole to the other side of the galaxy what kind of interesting thing can we make in that situation, right? I mean, how is this different from, say, Star Trek Voyager, where right, yeah. a similar thing happened, right? You know, and I and I was kind of thinking about it, and then I came up with this with this alien who's part of a hive mind, and who, um, because they're thrown so far away, he gets cut off from the hive mind. And now he has yeah. to, uh, you know, figure out his own individual identity. And yeah, it's very much, it's exactly the kind of thing that would happen on Star Trek. Yeah. Kind of yeah. And also when I, when I, when I thought of the, cause I sort of tweaked the rules for the world building each time. I was thinking of sort of an episodic show like Star Trek. So I'm glad that came across And I really liked the, yeah, the story that you told looking at what, it, what would it mean to be part of a greater whole and then be separated from that. Cause obviously there's just like in Star Trek, right? there's huge human resonances there as well. Like none of us are a hive mind, but we all could have that sense of how do we develop a sense of self um, when we're surrounded by other people, but then cut off from other people. I, I thought you did a great job with that story. Okay. Um, I'm speaking. So we mentioned comic books a few times now. That was one of my things. So I know that we have a shared love of comic books. Um, I guess, can you talk a little about what is your relation to comics? Um, what role do they play in your reading, writing and creating um, and if there's any in particular that have sort of influenced your, inspired your, your own work. Yep. So um, I read comics when I was a kid. My orthodontist had Daredevil. It happened to be written by Frank Miller at the time. Uh, yeah. I was very lucky Classic. that he had it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was in, and then I kind of, as I got older, I kind of fell off in a little bit. Yeah. And I didn't read as many comics anymore, to be honest. And then in college, I was reading The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, you know, I was asking around, like, what do you read after? I loved it a big influence on me um and afterwards the next thing that kind of that group of friends that was reading it recommended for me to read was uh good omens by neil gaiman and terry pratchett that got me back into the comic store i had to pass there used to be this really great huge comic book store across the street from the empire state building on 34th street called uh, jim haley's universe yeah. um it's since moved twice it keeps moving further yeah. east uh, but so I went in there and I kept buying the next Neil Gaiman book. And while I was in there, I got into Alan Moore and I got into Garth Ennis. And I thought that a lot of the writing they were doing was really literary and really good. And I preferred it to the literary fiction that was going on at the time. So I was always reading my speculative fiction. Um, you know, I was still reading through the myriad of Terry Pratchett Discworld books and um, I was reading Game of Thrones before anyone else was before that. I kept <laughs> recommending it to people who didn't want to read thousand page novels. You know, so I was reading all that kind of stuff. I really and didn't I, like what was being written in the early 2000s. There was okay. something about it that I just, I didn't like Friends and I didn't like Latham and I didn't like that whole set that was really popular at that time. But I really did like the Alan Moore stuff. And the Garth and stuff, and I thought nice. they were doing really interesting literary stuff in this comics medium, you know. And yeah. I kind of got into it through there, and then eventually I had an idea for a story. I was already writing; I was a writing major in college. I was writing short stories and sending them off to literary magazines and things like that. And I had a story that just wasn't working, and I was wrestling with it. And I knew it was an idea I had to write. And then I was thinking about it, like, this has to be a comic book. Like that's why it's not working. It's not a pro story. It's like you've been reading all these comics. It's it's a comic book, and that sort of started me down the path to adding comics to uh, to the various genres that I write. 
Um, so tell me a little, so what are, your, what are some of the current projects that you are working on? Because I know, sort of like me, you tend to have about a half a dozen irons in the fire, it sounds like. So what are some things you're doing? All the time. I mean, is this my uh, solution? One of my solutions to writer's block, have as many works in progress yeah. as possible. You block on one, you move over to the other. Yeah. So I am working on a uh, fantasy novel that um, I call it meta fantasy. It's okay. kind of fantasy that's aware of itself, sort of in the vein of Terry Pratchett, but it's a quest, which I don't think that he ever did, um, where it's a traditional fantasy quest. He goes through all of the Campbell stages. And all 17 uh, stages of that. Yeah, uh, everything. Yes, that's how I structured yeah. you know, the book, but mm -hmm. all of them are wrong. You know, there's two things that happen. I got, you know, the dark wizard intercepts the chosen one and is trying to lead him on the quest himself so that when he finishes it, he'll be the influence to prophecy. Meanwhile, the, the good wizard finds some random street urchin and happens to stumble <laughs> him in the right time. So you got these two parallel quests going and um, 350 or so pages into it. And um, hopefully that will be done this year. Um, of course, I said that last year, too, but, <laughs> you know, um, I'm working on a Sherlock Holmes multiverse story, Sherlock Holmes and Ooh. quantum theory, where Sherlock Holmes inhabits a universe populated entirely by late 19th century public domain characters. <laughs> where, um, and, you know, the mystery is he has to figure out that he, in fact, is one of them. Like he, at the beginning, he thinks he's Sherlock Holmes and the mystery that he's trying to figure out. You know, so he encounters, you know, he encounters Dr. Jekyll when he's at the university. Uh, the artful Dodger, who is now an old man, has taken over for, uh, for Fagan and is trying to steal the Baker Street Irregulars away from him. Uh, the coach runs over Dorian Gray, and of course they think it's Watson's attending to him, but then of course he gets up and walks away because, you know, there's a scene where Mike, Ro you know, he's with Mike Roth in the uh, club where no one's allowed to talk and uh, they're doing the thing that Watson hates where they're just picking guys out on the street and like <laughs> identifying which book they you know, that type of thing. So those, those are some of the major ones. I'm working on a poetry chapbook, um, okay. cool. gothic poetry chapbook, which is a, a series of 15 connected poems. Um, and then the second comic book school anthology. I'm working on the second Mr. Stupendous story, which is heavily influenced by the first few episodes of the way WandaVision was. We jumped through time in various cool. ways. And hopefully I'll be writing a flash fiction piece for that as well, in addition to editing that book, co-editing that book. Cool. I had wanted to write since I had read Tolkien in seventh grade, but I didn't actually. It's like, wow, all those stories I'm playing with my class of Legos, but people actually want to read that. I major in, uh, in college. I was a creative writing major in college. And um, I graduated in 2000. I actually had my first story published in a literary magazine in 2002. And I was kind of doing it um, semi-seriously since then, because I was publishing for a while. But really, um, you know, just as the years went on and I got hopefully better at it and better at actually sending things out. Um, it's sort of, I would say in the last six years or so, I've really gotten more serious about um, finishing things and sending things out and, um, you know, actually submitting things, which, you know, I would do one or two a year and I would have, yes, I have stories published almost every year going back to 2002 yes. or so, but, you know, it's really picked up in the last couple of years or so, last five or six, maybe. And I, know I hate the idea, like, where do your ideas come from? That's like the worst idea to ask any writer. So what are some specific things you can say? Like, I sort of, I go to this for like, to you know, just sort of go back to the well for creativity when it's not a book. Okay, so it's not because I do go back to my books a lot. I, I do a lot of my a lot of my writing has a retro quality to it, and it's uh, kind of a um, conversation with the past kind of thing, okay. um, either seriously or or satirically. But I'd say beyond books, um, a lot of it is just asking the movie trailer question. You know, mm -hmm. in a world where yeah. <laughs> you know, right. and then what are the implications of that? Like create you create a paradox of, of some kind, you know? So, you know, like for example, in, in I Am I, in, in the uh, Skullgate one with, um, with 
with triangle alpha three, right? So yeah, there might be. What, what if the Borg were the good guys or were among the good guys? It was a hive species that was on the good guy side. And what if they got cut off? And right. how would you deal with that? And if you dealt with that, and now all of a sudden you're cut off, how might you speak? You might your grammar might not be that yeah. good, right? I mean, you know, I've taught many students from many different backgrounds, and there are all sorts of different syntaxes and structures that creep in uh, because they're not writing or speaking in their native language. And it might, you know, if you were from a species where there was no individual pronoun because you're part of a collective mind, how might that affect the way that you, uh, you talk if you had no, you know, th things like that. And then each yeah. question begets another question. And um, before you know it, you have the story and trying to answer all those questions. We're trying yeah. to see, and it's not even how you would answer the question, right? It's how your character would, would answer the question. Yeah. So well, I like yeah with your with your you know, the IMI piece. I mean not I guess not to make too pretentious of a connection, but I'm thinking of like with James Joyce's portrait of an artist, how you know how the writing style in that book is specifically from infantile to growing up. And so to, like you see that evolution of the character, how at the beginning the syntax isn't really, really, you know, stilted to the point that I know some of the first editors were like, you know, I can't read this. Like, of course you could read that. That's the way it's supposed to do be. And that you sort of see him developing a grammar and uh, a way of thinking about himself um, as right. the story so evolves. I put that on the back too. I have the editor that said I was uh, Dickensian and now I have- I said you're James Joyce. Joyce. <laughs> yeah, those two, that's going right on the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. So sort of nearing, I guess, the end dish, because I try to keep these not from going too long. I do have, um, just for fun, a series of lightning round questions. Um, so sure. these are quick, short answers, one or two words. Um, don't think about them too much. What is your favorite book? Lord of the Rings. What is your favorite band? Bruce Springsteen. What is your favorite book to read to your kid out loud? I would say uh, Dragons, Dragons by Eric Carle. Are collected oh. by Eric Carl. Oh. Um, now, what, what's your favorite takeout dish? I, it used to be pizza until I developed cholesterol problems, and then <laughs> I unfortunately can't have it anymore. Yeah, Marvel or DC? You know, I go vertical. That lightning round, Marvel or DC? Uh, Marvel. <laughs> we can come back. To, okay. Yeah. Waffles or pancakes? Pancakes. Whiskey or beer? Ooh. Uh, craft beer or some of <laughs> scotch. Do aliens exist? Yeah. Yeah, most likely, yes. Will humanity be around in 100 years? Yes. Okay, nice. That was more positive than my last one, which almost made the person cry. It's like, you've caused me to have an existential crisis. Um, all right, and one of my favorite things on podcasts are like endorsements, so what's making you happy this week. Um, so I decided, like, what's something outside of your writing um, that just sort of making you, that's bringing you life this week? That's something you could say, hey, this was a cool thing I'm doing or listening to or read or ate. All right, so I mean, I guess I just got the COVID vaccine. That's the biggest thing. It's nice, a huge way literally, to it. just, giving you a, and two, other people life. Yeah. yeah, yes, just big thing. I actually got a uh, not to be too hipsterish, but I actually got a vinyl record in the mail today, a signed vinyl record by a okay. by a blues artist named uh, Papa Chubby. Okay, uh, cool. You know him. Um, he was kind of big in the New York blues scene um, for a while. He had a residency at. Well, the rodeo bar, which doesn't exist, which used to be on Twenty Third Street, but he used mm -hmm. to play there. What's uh, what's the record title? The record title? Yeah, is a uh, Tin Foil Hat. Tin Foil Hat. I mean, by check uh, that out. by Papa Chubby. Awesome, cool. Um, All right, thank you. That's it for now. Um, again, I've been talking to A. A. Rubin. Um, his website is aarubin.wordpress.com, and you can find that link in the link to all his um, various social media and online accounts below in the show notes. Um, you can find his story, I Am I, in Under New Suns, which is on sales now. Um, you can get it and Skullgate's other books directly from our online store at www.skullgatemedia.com, as well as Smashwords, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, or support your local bookstore and ask them to order our books for you. If you're a writer, we're currently gearing up to do volume three of Tales from the Year Between. So if you'd like to join us in creating a new world, see the application guidelines at yearbetween.com. 
We're also open to submissions for a more standard anthology and are looking for winter-themed speculative fiction. And you can read all about that at our website, SkullgateMedia.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and our podcast of the same name, Sound from the Year Between, at wherever you find your audio addiction. Don't miss our updates and content. Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Twitter at Skullgate Media. And I'll see you in two weeks. All right. Thanks for coming by. Thanks, thanks Chris. Thanks for having me.